thank you for coming tonight. Let's give it a let's give it up this up first. We just had our uh, another first meetup in New York City where I'm based. I'm just sort of rolling through uh, San Francisco on my way down to LA, and I thought, why not just let's bring the community together? Um, did you guys get enough food? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Drink. I'm actually very disappointed by San Francisco's drinking abilities. Like you guys need to drink more. Like this is a uh, there's a lot of blood alcohol that needs to be finished by the end of tonight. So all right, so. Welcome. Um, well, another thing, let's say thank you to Rock Health for letting us uh, host this. Rock Health has been an enormous supporter of Open and Health since we began, and you know they we're just really honored to be here and let them just allowing us to do this on such short notice as well. Um, uh, I'll make it, uh, just a few announcements um, before we get kick off with the show. And if Mike doesn't come, uh, we'll just kind of play it by ear. This is going to be a very casual. I know we'll come up and we'll talk and then go from, go from there. But um, first announcement. So we will be having our first Open Up Health Summit uh, on June 17th, right here in San Francisco. We uh, are probably going to be doing it at Fort Mason. I just checked out the venue yesterday. It's beautiful. Um, and we would love for you guys to come. Anyone who contributes code to the event, or contributes code to Open and Health, comes for free. Um, we'll probably make the whole thing for free, but anyway, this is going to be... <laughs> it's a small venue, so we have to be very, uh, well, we have to be very quite selective. But anyway, we would love for you guys to come. It's, it's a celebration of everyone who has been building uh, with Open and Health, tool makers, products and services, hospitals and clinics, um, and we're just really excited about doing this, because it's just, it's just really great to see people that, that, our, that our word has really been spreading around the world and that people are using Open and Health. Another thing, oh, let's go back. Uh, another thing is that uh, as, as a nonprofit startup, we are always looking for supporters and sponsors of Open and Health to really help grow our mission and you know, create events like these um, and to help with the summit as well as to help to grow the technology that we have uh, that makes it all free and available. Another announcement, we're looking for a software engineer. So if you know of anyone who is, uh, how, many, how many engineers in the room? Let's, let's uh, boom. That, is, that looks good. So if you know of anyone who is a uh, backend engineer, um, front end, uh, software engineer, but with like a backend focus, loves APIs, knows how to use them, and wants to make things bigger and better, come talk to me, go to this link, bit.ly.softeng backend. You find it on our website too. Go start the blog post for that. Uh, oh yeah, we're also really excited that we just uh, announced another meetup group that we're co-sponsoring, co-hosting with Spi out in London. Um, it's called Mobile Health Meetup, and we just we just launched it on Friday last week, and now we have 56 people uh, in there. So that's kind of cool. So if you know anyone in London, uh, we'll be organizing another meetup um, talking about uh, clinical research <coughs> using mobile health technology, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So yeah, stay tuned for that. We'll put out some announcements on that too. Okay, open and health. Um, like I said, we're a nonprofit startup with the mission of unlocking the potential of digital health data so it could be used in the clinical environment. Uh, we what open and health is, a lot of people ask us what we are, and we're open source software that helps you use digital health data with cl clinical grade data schemas. So if you go to github.openandhealth.org, uh, um, you'll find all of our technical offerings there. Um, we're in the process right now working with Jasper <laughs> to uh, to make to put this more on our website, but a lot of this is there and, and, and get various GitHub repos. You'll find that we have our data schemas that have um, some very generalized ones, as, that, as well as these very clinical uh, data schemas that Ida and Simona, who are here, have really worked very hard to design. Um, which you'll see physical activity just as an example. Um, their JSON schema, uh, and you see that we reference clinical standards in these schemas, uh, which is really important to, to make those schemas clinically useful. Uh, and there's some example uh, code as well. You can go to the GitHub repository, pull all the schemas um, as you wish, um, and we're, we're constantly updating them as well. We also have our data point API. This is the, this is the backbone of OpenML. Um, let's see if it's loading. Yeah. Okay. 
And it's a RESTful API that allows you to um, authenticate and authorize users and connect, uh, connect up digital health data. Um, so if you have a tool that, let's say, you want to expo share your data or expose your data with the world, you can use this API. Um, we also have a, another a shim server, which is a shim is a, it's an adapter from one API to another. You'll probably uh, think about this as like similar to Validic or Human API, but we have a, the same, the similar connections to some of the biggest sources like Fitbit, Java, Runkeeper, freely available. Um, you can deploy it and use this Docker, um, and it's just it's open and people are using it today. Um, so that's a little bit about what what is Open Health and what we have. Okay, so tonight, so tonight is a very exciting event um, because ten or two weeks ago, Apple announced Research Kit, um, and it was it just really shook the world, I think, because you know you have clinical studies that would have ten thousand people being a really big trial, a really big clinical study, and overnight, you know, you, just, you had eleven thousand people sign up for uh, an app that you know via via Stanford. You also you know, I think the numbers are up to 47, 50,000 across all the different applications, which is just enormous in 14 days. Um, these meetups are going to hopefully happen more regularly. Um, the, the purpose of these meetups is to do a few things. One is to really bring uh, clinical domain expertise, talk about a problem, talk about what's going on in healthcare. And then this, the second part of these events will be to talk about some of the engineering solutions that are used to be able to solve those problems. Typically, we'll talk about Open and Health uh, engineering solutions, but or people who use Open and Health. But it's not exclusive to that. We just really want to foster this relationship between clinical problems, uh, real healthcare problems, and what uh, solutions are solving those. Uh, but this tonight's event is just really special because we have uh, Dr. Mike McConnell, uh, professor at Stanford, doctor at Stanford, who helped build the My Heart Counts app, um, and Dr. Ida Sin, co-founder of Open and Health. And professor of medicine at UCSF. Um, Mike is also advises us uh, on clinical things that we that we're interested in, and um, this will be very informal. I think maybe Mike will we'll talk a little bit about his experience. I know we'll talk a bit about how uh, what Open and Health can really bring to the table. We'll open it up for Q and A. Then you guys eat more dumplings and drink. <laughs> so if there's any, so Mike, you want to take it away? Sure. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Sure. Good to see you. Yeah, thank you. Mind if I sit? Yeah, please. Keep us informed. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, thanks to Gator and Ida for inviting me to come. Um, Ida and I were med school classmates, so uh, I was excited to, uh, when I first heard about Open End Health, to participate and, and try to make that effort. Um, I was a bioengineer um, turned cardiologist. Um, but I'm not a data expert, and the last piece of the software I put it up, how long ago that was, so. Um, but I'm very passionate about trying to bring um, kind of digital technology to healthcare. Um, and cardiovascular disease is a lot about prevention. Um, so a lot of what we decide to do on a daily basis in terms of how active we are and what we eat um, has a big impact on our risk. So, uh, so I think the, the idea of being able to work with technologies that people have with them, um, I, I think has been very exciting. Uh, I just came from uh, Eric Topol, I uh, was just talking at Stanford, whose latest book, you know, tries to reverse the empowerment of the patient versus the, the physician, and uh, I think it's very interesting. Um, so, um, research kit and the the study that we launched. Um, I think there's a piece, of course, I get most of my news on this from Matt Rumors. Um, I think they had cited an article that Stephen Friend from Sage Bio Networks, uh, who's involved in several of these apps, uh, was actually at the Stanford Medicine X conference presenting. <coughs> and Mike O'Reilly, who had recently been hired as a physician by Apple, I was at the conference and Stephen Friend was talking about trying to have open uh, data sharing and you know moving research where you can have much greater participation. And so I think Mike uh, came up to Stephen and they kind of got this ball rolling around the idea that could, on top of health kit, 
you know, which is trying to bring data together uh, around connected devices and health information. Could they build something on top of that that would enable research studies through your phone? Um, and that's basically, you know, what research kit is. Uh, it's an additional set of tools built on top of, you know, iOS and health kit. Um, that has some key things that most research studies need. It has an interactive consent process. Um, it has ways to do surveys. And then it has the ability, and this is where each app was a little different, you would build various tasks that would be part of your study. So probably like the Parkinson's app has um, some tapping tests. Um, there are tasks for the, the, for the glucose app, bars. We're very interested in, you know, really the fact that everybody has a phone and has it with them most of the time uh, is a great way to try to look at people's physical activity as well as a way to enter information that they can get their own risk score and be hopefully more knowledgeable at the same time that we can look at data around physical activity and risk factors in a very large uh, group. Um, so, you know, obviously it, it's a a new way to try to do this. Um, it has certainly a lot of potential in that, you know, given that it timed with a, with an Apple event, the, the initial signups were quite large. Um, but I think, you know, <clears throat> the the notion I think also like the Parkinson's, they, you know, overnight had now more people in a Parkinson's trial than had ever, you know, been uh, enrolled. But obviously there are a lot of issues around doing it this way, right? It's, the, it's up to the individual to either keep their phone with them or do the tasks and to enter the data appropriately. I and mean, there's always been an issue if you do survey-based studies that people can still choose how they want it and answer questions on the survey. But putting a lot more of the research data in a sense in the hands of the user rather than measure, you know, coming into getting a test in a hospital um, it does change the paradigm in ways that I think there's a whole interesting research area about how to study this form of kind of more consumer driven or crowdsourcing based research. Um, I mean, that's kind of the background. I don't really know anything more secret about what goes on that Apple, as you probably know, they are very cordoned off. So, um, you know, what, what you saw. Read about research kit is pretty much about what I know about research kit, um, and uh, you know we're excited to integrate uh, the watch and other wearables certainly in our study, but uh, we need more information once that becomes public about how best to do that. Um, I guess other comments may think there one of the other you could say disadvantages of um, the start of this is that it's based on, you know, in our study in particular, um, you know, uses the latest phone that has a motion chip that doesn't drain the batteries. So you have to have people who have, you know, an iPhone and have to have the latest iPhone um, and update it to the latest operating system. So you're really not reaching, the, you know, the level of the population that we would want to. And you could argue maybe we're reaching the part of the population that may need it the least, and you know, being able to broaden um, <coughs> the reach of studies like this, I think is very important. So uh, it was nice in the, in the launch event, and this wasn't known to us, um, that you know, they were, we knew they were gonna release research kit more broadly, uh, but that they're gonna make it open source, and I think that the potential to widen the use of this idea, uh, you know, I think is I think is a great uh, part about this, and I think offers lots of opportunities to work together on how to really broaden the ability for you know our study and the other studies that are developed to implement them over very broad platforms of devices and, and operating. Oh, if I have too much more of an interest.
intervention than that and we did talk for but it's not going to talk yeah. first and then we can yeah well, yeah why don't you get up and uh, we'll have a conversation yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's the fun part um i guess i see that the research kit thing is three pieces one is the health kit piece which is where the data is coming in from the phone right and then exposed to the rest of the stuff on the phone then there is a research kit which sits on top of that, and I think a research kit is having sort of two major functions. One is study onboarding, which is clinical researchers were super excited about. It's a friendly way to do informed consent. Those are words you would never hear in research, right? Um, uh, and, uh, and I can talk more about how uh, the SAGE uh, uh, bio networks informed consent system works within, within research kit as much as I know about that. Um, and then the other part is, is data collection, you know, very friendly data collection that, you know, real people can use in their daily lives. And, and that's exciting because that is that sort of, I think of that as the last mile of research often, and it's also the last mile of, of, um, of data collection that we would want in, in clinical care. It's something that we haven't really had in, uh, in, in, in healthcare much before, and doing it in a way that, that um, uh, that's, you know, reach out to patients where it's friendly and hopefully we'll get to populations that, that we couldn't otherwise get to, you know, although you know, the issue of it being iOS 8 and, and, and just iOS, of course, uh, does lead to bias. But I think it, it breaks the paradigm. It ups the ante, it changes the way that research feels. Um, and the fact that it's open source also means that, you know, people can, can hack up a study, right? People in here. Um, and I think that's great. I'm really for participatory research, participatory medicine, where um, there are a lot of patients group who have questions that they want to ask that those of us in universities don't want to ask, but they're just as legitimate questions. And, and when people can start to come together and make studies or collect data uh, or randomize or do informed consent in a really nicely thought out way, those, those are things that are good. They're really good. Now, as I said, this is the last mile. So what about all these? miles you know, upstream. And there's a lot going on there. There's um, what kinds of questions you ought to ask, uh, what study designs you should have, what data you should collect, and how you should represent that data. Because right now there's a lot about this kind of medicine that we don't understand. We don't understand what measures we should have, how we should respond to those measures, and we need to study them. And it's better if we study them by being able to pull the data from different studies together. And to do that, we need to standardize the data. And that's actually where Open Health comes in. So what we're trying to do is provide standardized schemas for things that are really critical in clinical care with the features that we know are important clinically. So if you're dealing with blood glucose, I'm going to need to know whether it's fasting or random or postprandial. Right? Those of you who are clinicians or diabetics will know that. Um, and that's true for blood pressure as well. Right? Obviously, systolic and diastolic, but is it blind sitting or standing? Um, you know, uh, I'll give you an, an anecdote uh, and, and then we'll stop for questions. Um, the Empower app, I, I think, is really cool, right? That's the Parkinson's one where you can talk into it and tap, tap it. Um, and it also measures gait. So, uh, I don't know when research came out. Two weeks ago. Two weeks ago? Yeah. So, last, last Wednesday, I had a patient in play who has Parkinson's. And he's had Parkinson's for many years. And I knew him before he had Parkinson's. Parkinson's is a, is a diagnosis of, of clinical exclusion. You can't just like do a test and say, ah, oh, you know, levels over X, they have Parkinson's. It's really the evolution of the pattern of disease. So this is a patient that I've been co-managing with the neurology. He's been on a drug called Cinemet, uh, which treats Parkinson's. And it's been, a, you know, really a lot of years. Um, and he thinks the Cinemet is sort of collapsing his thinking. He's like a 76-year-old Chinese guy. And he can say, well, you know, my thinking's kind of cloudy, and so I, I, I don't think the sentiment's working. So, so, well, okay, so, you know, discuss with the neurologist, and the neurologist say, yeah, you know, he doesn't think it's really working for him, so, so he should just stop it. Now, Parkinson's is diagnosed in part by your response to this drug called sentiment. So if you respond, it's Parkinson's, if you don't, then it's some other, you know, type of disease that's related, vascular Parkinson's or whatnot. So the neurologist is saying, I don't really have much data. He doesn't think it helps. Stop it. It's probably not Parkinson's. So I see the guy last Wednesday. He says, you know, I tried to stop cinnamon. And I said, yeah, we discussed that last time. What happened? He goes, you know, I stop it for about three days. And then I feel like I need to take it again. And I 
said, oh, why? He says, because I needed to walk better. And I said, oh, so are you walking better? He goes, oh, I don't know. You know, I said, so how many pills do you take? You take it one pill, two pills, or three pills? And how's your, you know, thinking with one, two, three pills? And how's your walking with one, two, three pills? He goes, well, sometimes I take three and for a while, and then I cut back to two, and then, and then I'm off it, and I feel totally fine, but then I feel like I need to be back on it again. So that's the state of medicine today. <laughs> <laughs> I am completely blind. He's completely blind to what the hell is going on. And the neurologist says, patient doesn't think cinnamon helps. He can stop it, period. Okay, now you can imagine what the Parkinson's app would do, right? I want to know when he's taking his cinnamon. I want to know his gait. And I don't want to know his gait like the way an orthopedics person would want to know. I want to know his gait for Parkinson's symptoms. Is he festinating? Right? Is he, uh, and, and I don't actually know this, uh, but you know, festination is one. What are some of the other um, um, mobility issues that's important to him? That's what I want to know. And I want to know it over a time scale, which is days, correlated with his medication. I don't need a daily log or something or other. I need it in the context of something that's meaningful. So those are the kinds of things we need to get to. Uh, the, the, the research needs to help us get there. So the onboarding and the informed consent helps us recruit more people to start to answer these kinds of questions. And that's where the excitement of research kit comes in, I think, is it just really gives us a window into something that, you know, I hope can help my patient because I really don't know what to do with it. So yeah, I'll just leave it at that. Yeah. Maybe just adding on that, um, you know, in this mobile health space, there's really been such a lack of data on what things are beneficial. You know, is a particular app um, <coughs> helpful in managing your patient, like this case? <laughs> You know, for cardiovascular disease, a lot and many diseases, a lot of Adam's behavior, and you know, even even the watch coming out is supposed to have all these behavioral, you know, coaching and all these other things, but there's no data as to, you know, what the most effective modalities. The fact that we can have a platform where you can do some A/B testing of different behavioral interventions to look at how that impacts physical activity or you know other markers or other contributors to cardiovascular or other diseases, I think is a huge opportunity too, because ultimately we want to have the data, real world data um, that we've studied in a research context that then informs what we bring to the clinic. Yeah, I, I'd go uh, further than that even also and say that yes, we need data from research studies, but um, we also need to think more carefully about how the evidence builds upon itself. So one thing to do is to think, we have a behavioral intervention, an app, let's say a text app or a smartwatch app or something, and you evaluate with a nice trial, maybe you have a research kit and you get 30,000 people, and you know, it doesn't work, okay? What did we learn? Why, what was it about it that didn't work, right? Or another app does work, well good for that company, but how do we, how do we generalize that? So there are theories about behavior change. Um, is, is the intervention one of engagement? Is it one of motivation? Is it one of self-efficacy? Is it one of, uh, you know, there's just a whole bunch of theories about behavior change and we need to start indexing our science by the theory so we can be testing theories. We need to be testing theories and not apps and solutions. That's how science moves ahead. And so we need to standardize not just the data, but also the kinds of questions we're asking and how we're asking them so that we can learn more together, which is perhaps you know, different than the typical um, evaluation we commonly do in drugs, right? It's like, well, does this drug work or not? Uh, but even there, we think, oh, this is a cardiovascular drug or an ACE inhibitor, and we can you know, know something about ACE inhibitors by this ACE inhibitor trial. We need to do the same for behavioral medicine and think more theoretically about what it is we're trying to do when we try to change people's behaviors. Do you guys, do you guys think that there's potential to you know, use research kits for things that are not clinical research to, to bring it you know, into the commercial markets? Or, I mean, like, I mean, not in, not in clinical research. I mean, having a framework would be useful for that to do like build, build an app and some sort of thing. Yeah, I think if you took out the informed consent piece, then it's just a data collection platform, right? Which is uh, which is cool. Um, I think informed consent, um, 
you know, we tend to overload informed consent in research. We tend to say, you know, there's all these risks, and if you click on this button, then everything's okay. <laughs> um, there's a lot more to informed consent. To me, it's really a process of being respectful to participants, um, to be clear about data sharing, to be clear about risks up front. And so I think that whole notion of informed consent is really a discussion about how we work with data together. And, and that, I think, is really important. And I think that should be part of, of everything. There's a lot of people in the room. Let's, let's open it up for Q&A. Um, stand up, say your name or your affiliation. If it's complicated, say it's complicated. <laughs> <laughs> no, my name is Mickey Brandis. I'm with Ginger.io. And we're available on the lab. Okay. Um, the question I have for you is, with respect to the informed consent process, does research kit allow IRB specific informed consent templates to use, or is it a standard template for any IRB study? Yeah, the best I can explain it, it has a whole set of screens um, that try to go through the standard parts of most uh, consent forms, which is you know what's expected of you, what's going to happen with your data, and what are the potential risks, what are the potential benefits. Um, so, you know, they, so there's a whole host of screens, and then behind each one, you can expand out to get, uh, you know, so some of it is kind of visual with a few lines, and then you, each one you can expand out to get more detail, um, and those are all customizable. Um, so, I mean, I think the graphics uh, and the general topics, you know, the head, the headings, you know, in terms of risks and benefits and what you need to know and data sharing are standard screens, but then the text that goes even with each of those screens and then certainly the text behind each one are all modifiable. And then it has <coughs> your actual consent form from your institution. So the, the final step is your IRB approved consent form opens up and you can read through that agree to that, and then a copy of that is sent to you. Um, so that completes the consent process. Uh, Sorry, Mike, does that mean you, you have to have, you have to be IRB approved with yes. your institution first before you can yes, you have deploy to, that? You have to come with an IRB. Yeah, so it, you know, it, it, it doesn't change that paradigm that research, human subject research needs to be reviewed you know, by your IRB. I mean, they're, there are certainly some levels of research that your IRB may say, you know, that may require different levels of consent um, based on the associated risk. But everything should be passed in front of your IRB, um, just like you would any other human research study. Uh, do you want to stand up and say that? Uh, I'm Neil Siegel. I'm from UCSF. Uh, CDHI actually in the Digital Health Innovation Laboratory. I have sort of like a, I guess a technical question about the informed consent process, and that is how do you deal with issues of uh, IRB preference of using stamped consent forms, you know, the consent forms that they have reviewed and approved? Um, Did you guys hear that in the back? No. I guess the question was how do you deal with the IRBs have kind of a stamped consent form that, you know, doesn't get exactly mimicked then on the screen there? Um, I, you know, the, what you need to discuss with the IRB, there will be a text version on the screen that can be reviewed and agreed to, um, and then, you know, the stamped, well, it wouldn't be a paper copyright, but they, I guess, is there a way to do it some way in a PDF that would satisfy uh, your IRB that, you know, that then is, is emailed to them? Sorry for the overly technical question. Yeah, yeah, no, I mean, I, I, I think the, the PDF and what you email them is probably the, the closest you can get to what they would want. I, I think something like Research Kit is going to hopefully finally really push IRBs to come a little bit into this, this century. Um, I think IRBs have been a, a real bottleneck in research, as you know, and requiring things like, you know, a printed document. Um, there, there are a number of groups that have been able to negotiate sort of one-off excuses from, you know, uh, to, to really do e-consent. 
Um, there is a new uh, common rule that is out for comment now by the Office of Science, Technology, and Policy. So that's the federal agency that manages all of the things about informed consent. Um, and there is a draft out there right now for comment, which is attracting a tremendous amount of comments on all sorts of aspects. Yeah, it was perfect timing because <laughs> it, it came time, out yeah. right after the recent kid. Uh, yeah, so I think, I think things are, are moving, and I think having something like Research Kit really, again, you know, makes people see, oh, wow, you can enroll tens of thousands of people. This is a great opportunity, but also a huge risk as well. And, you know, fighting a battle about whether it's a PDF is, is really fighting the wrong battle. So, I think things, things I think, will move. Other questions from the audience? From the audience? We're going to stand up and say your name and your affiliation. Uh, <clears throat> I'm Eric Villarreal from Easy Labs. We're a startup in the clinical research space. I just had a question on, you know, the development of the app. So, in terms of study design and app development and like architecture uh, of, of that system. Uh, can you describe a little bit of that process in terms of what was you know, Stanford's part of that and what was your sort of developer partner's part in that? And if you have a section to talk about maybe the results side, now that data is flowing, do you have that data? Are you processing it or what sort of happened with that? To the question. Oh, sure. So there's a question about kind of the app development process uh, as well as kind of what's happened so far with the study. Um, so yeah, the best way I can describe the app development process um, is that <coughs> there, you know, so we do the study design part um, of what we wanted our study to be. Um, you know, Apple mostly built research kit, which is, you know, they, they mostly build sandboxes for everybody to play in. Say. So they're building a toolkit, um, just like many SDKs for, for you know, other companies and other purposes. Um, and then we work with a third-party uh, app developer to build you know, our particular study on top of research kit. Um, we are kind of in the throes of, of looking at the data, but we don't have any um, results just because Yeah, we're obviously excited uh, about that part of it, and that's going to be, yeah, I, obviously getting the app and everything up and going, the launch was certainly a, a lot of effort, but it's probably going to be even more effort on the, on the data side, and, and uh, yeah, I think, um, you know, in some ways it was a, obviously exciting to be part of this, we were also kind of part of the guinea pigs, all the different institutions that participated to try to you know, work together around this consent process and some of the survey mechanisms and, and get that going. Um, you know, the hope is that for everybody else, it'll be a little bit easier going. Uh, and I think that's part of the, the goal is that there'll be a, 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 a toolkit and that will be available for people to, you know, when you have go from a concept of a research study to implementation that that timeline not only to implement a study but then to recruit patients for it and get data from it you know will, will go much more quickly because I think you know we've all recognized that our technology is about is developing very rapidly and if our research if our ability to study it is at a totally different time scale you know then then the technology is not gonna you know it's hard for us to know what to do clinically because by the time a research study comes out, you know, you're two, three generations ahead of the technology and, you know, not sure. I, you know, I know the, the Heart Association is going to come out with the document soon that's going to talk about, you know, what's all the results of kind of digital health or cardiovascular disease. And, you know, most of the published literature is by text messaging and other, you know, several generations or ago. Or I think there's some more. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I mean, I think there, there's going to be else. I mean, it, it's good that they're going to come out with this publication, but at the same time, it, it shows you that lag between, um, you know, when we have some data and you know, when it comes out in literature that, um, you know, helps to guide people that all, all the technologies almost that are in that, doc, you know, many of those technologies will be out of date if not even non-existent. 
Yeah. <laughs> um, where does the data go? So um, the data, and it, I think all the apps uh, describe this, um, it was set up with the first five apps that the data is going to Sage Bio Networks. So this is a nonprofit based in Seattle, um, where Stephen Friend is the head of it. They're involved, I think, in the Parkinson's app and the breast cancer app. Um, and they have had uh, a research, or they have had servers to do uh, medical research with different institutions in the past. Um, and in particular, they have it designed so that data goes to an initial server where the study data is separated from, say, the email and the consent side of it. And then gets pushed up to what they call their Synapse server. Um, so there it's just, and I guess there are all these different words now, it's coded data or anonymized data or de-identified data. Um, <clears throat> with the idea that it's at that place is where then outside groups, so, so then we access the data on the Synapse server. Um, and so that main, the main server that is available for kind of outside access uh, or analysis does not have any, you know, personal identifying information. Uh, so and that know. becomes then also a platform that ultimately is you look to share, you know, open that to other qualified researchers who may want to do research on the data, that that server becomes, um, So you know, Stanford doesn't own its own copy. This was, it was part of the agreement that, that the data goes to the synapse, what I think they call it, the bridge server. So was that a, was that a requirement? Did you did, did the um, guy said, well, we want to hold it on, you know, the Stanford server, and let Sage have access to it, or was it required that you had to store it on their server? And this data stays there. You can't get your own copy. Um, so I, I guess the way it evolved. Um, was they were setting this up for all the groups that were starting, and they had been working on this for some time, um, and it, I think it just made sense for all the initial apps to, to do this. Um, you know, in the end, I don't think it was ultimately a requirement, um, and, <clears throat> you know, I think we have the ability to bring data off the Synapse server onto uh, onto Stanford servers. Obviously, it's you know coded or anonymized, um, um, but uh, but I think that was you know again part of an initial group trying to work together to um, get this all working. That that was but right. The bridge server is what initially receives it and that separates and pushes the coded or anonymized data up to. Analysis. Uh, 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 yeah, my name is Mitsuha Deishi. I'm with uh, We Are Curious. Um, we are making a, a health app for integrating data in genetic and personal tracking and devices and so on. Um, so I have a couple questions. So the first is IRB and informed consent. So we're, we're doing most, we're sort of like pushing um, a consumer angle where people, consumers sort of patients or whatever you want, users look into their own health and do things sort of on their own. Uh, but we want to interface with research as well. So we've been working on an informed consent process uh, where people can share data with research. Um, but one question, I'm not, I'm, you know, Linda has a, obviously a better understanding of this, but I'm, I'm still a little bit clear on the, about when IRB is needed and when, uh, what it means, because let's say you have a bunch of people who are collecting data, they, are, they have Parkinson's or they have chronic fatigue or some, some, something, and then they want to share it with research, but they're not necessarily, you know, it's not necessarily the case that they know what the study is going to be in advance. Um, does, our, does IRB have to approve every separate use of that data that they share, or? You know, they, if they're just like, well, I just want to share my data with research. I don't care what you do with it. What is our, what is the IRB process <coughs> about something like that? That's mm -hmm. so a that, hard question. <laughs> do you want to summarize it? Well, I think the the question was, I mean, 
you know, we're, you know, as, as I guess Terry Coppola's, you know, book, the, the patient will see you now, but I mean, you have a lot more um, patients or participants or users in our population collecting data about themselves um, that they may want to donate for research, right. uh, may want to see it get used well. Um, I mean, that was part of the impetus of with research kit that ultimately users have the option to put to have their data shared by other qualified researchers beyond you know the primary um, institution right. ran the study. But what are the your question was more about what are the IRB rules about that kind of consumer driven data sharing, research data sharing. Uh, I'll start off. I still don't know the answer. You know, repeating the question didn't, didn't help me figure out the answer. Um, I mean, usually, I guess I usually talk to our IRB. I mean, they they don't want to overly regulate something they don't think needs to be regulated. And you know, most uh, IRB websites, you know, they'll have this question tree and arrows that they'll try to lead you down to say, you know, yes, it involves humans. It involves data. <laughs> Um, so you should think about talking to the IRB, and then, you know, and then what's the specific scenario? And they can tell you, you know, usually give you some guidance as to, um, you know, whether you need a consent process or. Uh, and there are again different levels of consent um, for different levels of risks. So. I think in, in general the IRB mechanism, you know, applies to people who have a, a federal ID as a as a research institution. And the whole IRB thing is set up to, to protect patients, right? It's, it's, it comes under the declaration of Helsinki, it's to protect persons, it's to provide equity, yada, yada, yada. So the notion is if it's your data and you're experimenting on yourself, you don't need to be protected from yourself. Right. Right. right? So the, the problem is, or, or, or the, it gets blurry, you know, because at some point you're not just studying yourself, you're studying yourselves. And when you study yourselves, there may be risk to yourselves. And when does it become something that, that needs some kind of regulation? I think that's completely up in the air. Up in the air yeah. Very up in the air. I think as soon as researchers get involved, you know, we, we tend to, you know, lean over backwards by our means, right? But I think that Facebook, remember the Facebook scandal, yeah, yeah. right? So I, that was an issue where Facebook did a study, which I thought was you know, a reasonable thing for them to do. They didn't need IRB because it was just a marketing study. And then, uh, and then uh, uh, university investigators got involved, one of whom became a postdoc here at UCSF, and I know her and was talking to her. And, you know, and then she ended up getting caught in a situation where you know, she was doing research on data that was collected without an IRB, and then the, I think it was Columbia or Cornell or one place, just sort of said, fine, you know, this data was already collected without an IRB, so, you know, there's nothing to protect anymore. Whatever harm there was, was already done, which I think was also a reasonable thing. So maybe so, it's more, it more applies to situations where the researchers are setting up the data collection itself, as opposed to just consuming data that Generally so, generally so, but there are risks if you are uh, uh, taking in data and doing some analysis for which there may be harm. So I think really the thought again isn't so much you know, the regulation, but can there be harm? Uh, and, and if there is harm, uh, how can that be mitigated and how can the participants be protected against harm? I, I think that's really the, the way to think about it. Uh, and, and, then, and then the legal stuff. Is just a small thing on top of that. I mean, the question is they may want to give you the data, but they're not necessarily expecting that they give you the data and then you share it with the rest of the world. So, I mean, right there, there's a potential risk that if, if that right. isn't communicated clearly. But presumably, that's part of the consent process when they share the data, like we try to make that clear what the risks are and so yeah. on. Yeah, so, yeah, informed consent is, you know, different levels, right? There's informed consent for, for, for risk. Um, and there's this informed uh, consent for the risk of disclosure, which comes from data sharing. And so, you know, being really upfront about, you know, if you're going to collect the data, are you going to share it? Who are you going to share it with? Why are you going to share it? And then, yeah, then it gets to, do you have to get approval for every single reason for sharing it? And that's where it gets to be completely confusing and, and nobody knows. Mitsu, Neil, you guys can talk afterwards. Okay. Neil has a lot to add to that. Um, let's keep it moving. Um, Say your name. Um, um, my name is Kun, <coughs> co-founder of uh, User Labs. Um, I have a question about the, the ownership of the 
data. So I'm a little confused. So it's a study by Stanford, but the data, the data sits in a database of Sage bio networks, de-identified. Um, so who owns the data? Uh, what's your relationship with Sage bio networks? And in that sense, if Sage is building this data repository, I mean, which means which costs a lot of money. <coughs> um, do they have relationship with other research groups? Do also kind of like give them access to the data and get more research done based on that same data? Um, <clears throat> yeah, I, I got asked this question early on, like who owns the data? I guess my first reaction is I think the participants, I, I tend to think of the participants' data and, and we're responsible for it. <laughs> um, and, uh, even though it sits on the Sage Synapse server, we have the primary kind of ethical and, and research responsibility for it. And you know, ultimately, if we you know, ultimately decided that it needed to be primarily you know on our server as opposed to their server, that's ultimately our um, decision. Um, um, so I, I guess I don't know if that's exactly ownership, but but the primary responsibility is with us. Um, the, but I think your other question was more about the sharing aspect of it. Um, it is set up so that um, that we, again, we have oversight as the primary institution as to who could be considered a qualified researcher that the data could be shared with. So it's not, Sage can't run off and say, you know, we want to share with these 20 other people. I mean, obviously we would need to have equitable criteria we could just decide we only wanted you know, these two people and nobody else in the world to have access to it. But um, but yeah I think you know and and part of it any qualified researcher you know, you're not going to sell the data you know so we were very clear in ours that we're you know this is not going to be sold to third parties uh, you know to for profits and things like that. So you know, selling the data um, you know and, Apple, obviously, their interest has been to stay out of the data stream, so the data, you know, goes from the phone to um, to the server. It doesn't go through, uh, you know, an, an Apple server. So. What question do you set up, and then and then so I work on just a doc. Um, so, well, well, my question is, and so who becomes steward of research kit, meaning that who approves whether or not the study is appropriate to do for research kit? I mean, if Coca-Cola says, you know, let's see if there is, you know, a correlation between Coca-Cola and happiness, you know, we're going to do it through research kit and show people who drink soda or not, we're going to run for, right. for four miles. So is there anyone who's responsible for saying, well, this is really an appropriate set of good question, good design, and, you know, some information we want a better society? Or, you know, can anyone just throw something out to Apple and say, you know, I'm just going to do this? Yeah, to be honest, I don't know the exact answer to that. Because um, uh, I've involved in that decision making process. I mean, certainly with the start of it, everything had to be an IRB approved study. Um, and, you know, obviously that still seems to be the ideal way to, <laughs> to have, um, you know, things go on research kit that have IRB approval. But I, but I don't control that. I mean, that, that to me would make sense as a criteria. And then, you know, I don't really know what it becomes once it's open source and it can be on other platforms and, you know, so, um, so yeah, I mean, it, it, certainly as it becomes more broadly used, the idea that there could be some stewardship sounds like a good idea. Um, <clears throat> Question in the back of it. So, um, I'm Eric Meeks, I'm with UCSF. Why do you think Apple's doing this? What's their motivation? <laughs> Um, <laughs> well, I mean, I, I, I will say I've talked to a lot of people who work for, you know, larger companies and there is, I do get a strong sense uh, that one of the reasons is, you know, they feel like they made a lot of money in the technology business and they see healthcare as being very broken. And if there's a way that they can steer some of their effort towards healthcare, that that would be a good thing. Um, now, you know, maybe I'm being naive in thinking that that 
that that is genuine. But I really do believe that's genuine. Um, you know, obviously for all these companies, their brand and their image is important, and being doing good things in the healthcare space, um, you know, brings value to their you know their brand perception. Um, but you know, they were you know they you know Mike Mike O'Reilly you know it was described a little bit in in that story with talking to Stephen Friend, but you know they're like we have. A device that they announced they had sold 700 million of these. If we can enable research and do something to help in the healthcare and healthcare research um, with our platform, that that would be a big win all the way around. And Mike was an academic um, physician previously, and then worked in industry before going to Apple. He had been through IRBs and research studies and all those kinds of things and understood quite well the limitations of being able to do clinical research and and given the way technology and healthcare is moving, that if, if uh, smartphones could enable a new way to do research, that that, that would be great. Question? Hi, Kelly Perry from a software engineer currently unattached. Uh, Maybe it's just going along with this the, the question of, of, of sort of efficacy or reliability with respect to the devices themselves. Uh, but what, what sort of standards apply here? I mean, halter monitors do are, are vetted. Now, there, there's a long history of vetting that. And physicians, any patients understand, uh, have confidence that they work and understand the context in which their, their output is valid. Now, for, for something on one of these things that, uh, that reports to, to measure heart rate and with some variability indication. What, right. What's the issue? What, 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 what's the standard? Is it standardized? Well, I, it's, uh, it's actually the validation of the data, right, and, and of the device. Um, yeah, I think the FDA is, is trying to maintain the space for innovation <laughs> and not regulate too heavily. Um, but not also have a disaster on its hands. And I think it's a very fine line to cut. So as some of you probably know, there, there are approaches to regulate things that touch things that are already regulated. <laughs> That's basically what it is, right? So if, if there's a, a set of uh, devices that are now come under FDA regulation, and if your device touches that, your data touches it, then it's also regulated. But if it's not, so if it's like a purely consumer device, they help you eat or something, you know, or track your steps, then, then it's not going to regulate. So a large number of the sort of typical consumer stuff, they're, they're not going to regulate, even though that's data that could clinically be, be very useful. I think that the problem is that it's been hard for both industry, the sensor makers, um, and clinicians to partner with industry to do these validation studies. Uh, because, you know, it's hard, it's hard to get clinicians and engineers together uh, it's hard to find patients. The informed consent process is difficult. They don't really know what they're validating it for. Often, because these are sensors that, like the sleep sensor, like what what data do we really want out of it? You know, what what's clinical utility? Uh, so I think there are just so many questions that are open. Um, there have been meetings at the high level between um, industry, FDA, um, and NIH and NSF about this issue. Um, and I started a public-private partnership about three years ago to try and foster some kind of shared solution. Open Amp Health was actually at the table, uh, part of this PPP, and it kind of just didn't really go anywhere because it just it was just a, a big problem. The NIH has now put out a, a large uh, call for proposals for a research center that will hopefully address some of these issues. So I, I think there's recognition from the regulatory agency, from industry, and from academia that we need to work together, just like you know, for the internet, you know, industry and academia work together, uh, and, and I think that's that's coming. That's coming. I, mean, I, I definitely want to add to that because I think you know you're you're bringing up a critical issue with trying to do research more in kind of this real world environment where we're not bringing people into a laboratory where we've got them on all this kind of highly validated um, expensive equipment. Um, we're trying to use things that they have in their hands or on their wrists. And so you're inherently you have much fuzzier data. Um, 
Now, will it tell you most of the time that someone is, one person is more active than another? Certainly. Um, you know, will it give you, you know, somebody's VO2? Uh, no. And so, you know, how do we think of leveraging what's out there um, and not just saying because it's not a clinical gold standard that we would get in the lab, therefore, therefore we shouldn't do it. At the same time, recognizing that we need to keep trying to study and refine how we analyze and, and improve the data that we get from these sensors and phones. Um, but I, I, I think it's a, it's a great question. And I think it's, um, you know, it's, it's one of those things I also think, you know, our, our big data analytics guys, you know, also kind of looking at, at the streams of data that come in and, and what, how to help make sense of that. But, Right, I mean, I think that, uh, you know, much more patient-driven data and using, you know, non-kind of clinical sensors, um, you know, is, is a whole other novel aspect of doing research this way that, I, you know, I don't think we should shun, but I think we should recognize its limitations and try to keep studying it. There was a question in the back. I wanted to, did you still have it? Yeah. Yeah. Hi, yeah. Uh, so, Rohan, uh, Sorry, what? Uh, my name is Rohan. I'm Yeah. Uh, so, I'm curious, like, uh, when you guys designed the study, like, did you kind of know the limitations of what Research Kit did? Or did you have to build a lot of things yourself on top of Research Kit? Or, like, where? Like, what was that mix? Um, so, I think the the common things to research kit were the uh, consent process and the survey mechanism. Um, you know, in some ways to give reminders and scheduling different tasks. Um, but the individual tasks um, were mostly developed by each of the uh, groups. You know, the individual institutions that they were more kind of the study and disease area specific tasks. But you know, the hope is that as those those pieces, you know, get further refined, or you know, um, as research kit becomes more available, that, that tools that get built, um, you know, also, you know, the different tasks or tools um, beyond, you know, the consent process and some of these others, you know, also become part of the bigger research kit. And in, in fact, some of the the. Um uh, like for, for example, the Parkinson's one, you know, the tapping to see with this art, um, you know, sort of mobility issues in the hand. That is that is open source. So all of the all of the apps are open source. And uh, from what I heard was actually for some of the uh, apps, the Parkinson's one, uh, you know, there are standard clinical instruments that we use in clinical medicine that they could not put in research kit because it's licensed. You know, they, they have these. They divide them. Yeah, the bio and um, and Sage. You know, that the forensics thing uh, was quite adamant that uh, you no, know, the, the measures have to be open. Um, and, and so, yeah, they're they're going to be part of part of what's available out there. So that's another way to build sort of the research base is that we start to have common measures and start to reuse, uh, you know, the kinds of data we're collecting. So that's that's another exciting part of all this. We have one last question. We're going to stand up and then. Uh... Yeah. Mike Lacombe, I am a health researcher at UCSF, uh, and unlike a lot of folks right now, I don't come from much of a programming background. Our lab has uh, domain expertise in a number of health site topics. We'd like to collect mobile data. I'm wondering if you have any advice on how to connect with uh, developers who are on top of uh, using research kit and collecting sensor data. <laughs> I think I uh, okay, so there's enough alcohol. Yeah. There's enough alcohol. Yeah. Is there, is there any, any other questions about research kit or open health or? Um, I wanted to, yeah. to the last topic that came up. But I think I think an important part about this, from my perspective too, is um, I think it's really important that you know the research community as well as participants, you know, provide us feedback on these different. I think as to help this ecosystem evolve, um, we really, you know, we really want to get as much feedback as possible so that 
these different tasks and tools can be optimized, um, you know, with and iterated on as, as we get more feedback, both from users and researchers. So I, I think that's an important part of developing this whole platform. Well, the last question. Uh, so I'm uh, David Stark. I'm a neurologist and a biomedical informatics master's student at Stanford. Uh, but in response to your uh, question, I'm also a uh, participant in the Empower study. Uh, you know, I just downloaded it last week because I was interested as a neurologist. And um, you know what what I found in that, as I'm sure many people have found, that it requires a lot of activity. It's uh, asking me every day to complete that finger tapping test. So I, for one. Uh, would love to see more passive measures. You know, for example, variability in my uh, in my texting speed. You know, how quickly am I using the keyboard? That sort of thing. Now, obviously, that's very far from being validated. Finger tapping tests have been validated in more traditional settings. Um, but I, I, you know, I think it raises the question: How do we, uh, you know, more rapidly validate these non-traditional methods of collecting patient-generated health data? I think the Ginger IO guys in the back uh, could say something about that because you know, you guys, guys, you know, I'm familiar with you know what uh, what's going on there, and it sounds like they're using you know interesting non-validated measures that are collected from our mobile phones and are using that to change patient care. So you know, for Ida's patient who has Parkinson's. And has a fascinating gait. Uh, you know, we uh, we don't know how to validate the uh, you know the, the accelerometry data coming out of that. Hopefully, research kit would, would help with that. Um, but I'm curious how you guys are doing it because uh, uh, you seem to be able to go directly from patient you know generated data to uh, actual clinically utility. Anyway, that was my answer to your question and uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, question for these guys. <laughs> <laughs> um, well. If there are any more questions, I'm sure we'll get a chance to all talk to each other afterwards. But thank you all for coming to our first event. We'll be having another one soon. Uh, we're, we're building um, an, an app that would basically take HealthKit data and, put, and serialize it into Open Up Health JSON schema. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll be open sourcing that SDK so that anyone can do that uh, if they want to. Um, thank you so much for coming and drink and eat. And thank you, Mike, and thank you, Ida, for joining us. Thank you.